you have been a successful scholar, you have been a provost, and now you are a library dean. And I'm wondering about the skills, the similar skills that are required for those those positions, the similar skills that a, a scholar would need uh, as a, and a library director would need, the similar skills a provost would need and a, a library director, director would also need. But I'm also interested about any unique skills that a library director has to develop. I'd like to hear a little bit about mm. that. Well, there's no one way to do any of these jobs. Um, people who are asked to do them have to figure out how their skills and how their capacities match up with what's there. Um, I had another earlier career in which I was a chief information officer at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I've drawn on that experience thinking how here again I get to work with uh, extraordinarily qualified professionals who, here's the good news, none of them will suspect that I think I can do their job better than they can. <laughs> Uh, I didn't get promoted from the ranks. Getting promoted from the ranks is great, but if you don't, a virtue of it is you can share skills, complement one another, um, and I can be there for them in ways that uh, they're not so prepared to address. And I have to depend on them to do the things that they have the professional training and expertise to do that. Maybe the only other thing I would say is that having been a provost uh, gives me one particular advantage in this job, which is that I have a better idea than I ever would have had before how to manage up. I know what the library looks like from up. So I have a better idea what's reasonable to expect of my bosses, a uh, better idea of what it's reasonable for them to expect of me, um, and I hope I can advance our organization inside the university. Um, the better for that. I have a question about the field of librarianship then. Um, one of the things in my career that I found a little curious was the lack of a requirement of professional development. It's encouraged, but it's not part of our profession. And now, both from the view of a scholar and a provost, and now a dean of libraries, what is, uh, two questions, what is your thoughts about that for librarians, and I would say also personally for yourself, is there uh, subjects in the field of librarianship that you feel that would be useful for a dean to know? Well, sure. We do have in the structure in our institution um, a requirement of professional development for our professional librarians. I think what we're finding, and many of my librarian colleagues around the country tell me this, is that the old hard and sharp line between the professional MLS bearing librarian and staff doesn't work anymore mm -hmm. because many of the people who carry positions that are designated as staff are themselves serious senior responsible professionals without whom we could not function. And so we need to build the community of collegiality between staff and professional librarians and to the greatest extent possible um, eliminate class barriers anyway, retaining professional and functional differentiations and complementarities um, as we go. Um, I think the librarianship, like many other professions, has changed. Keeping up is harder than it used to be. There's new stuff all the time. Uh, one of my personal recommended strategies is to attend the Charleston Conference as often as possible. <laughs> Very wise good. choice. Wise, wise choice. choice. I'm, I'm glad you agree. <laughs> you talked about some new and provocative ideas, and you, you, you turned uh, strategic directions, I guess I would say, that libraries need to, need to be looking at. You called them three priorities, I think is how you phrased it. I was wondering, for those folks who weren't able to attend, if you could talk a little bit about those priorities. Well, so I'd frame it this way. First, um, I always like to talk about three priorities ever since a colleague of mine about 20 years ago uh, looked at me and said, you know, Jim, if you've got more than three priorities, you probably don't actually have any priorities. Um, by the time, if it's more than three, it's a to-do list uh, or a guilt list, and it's a different kind of thing. But I would also say quite seriously that I think one of the things I can bring to this job is a history of not having been down in the weeds and therefore, there are advantages of having been down in the weeds, but my advantage is um, I can spend time, this my first year in the job, um, looking for the horizon um, and thinking in the larger picture about where we need to go in the 10, 20, and 50 year time frame. And then building back from that to say what's really important right now. 
Uh, there are plenty of things that are important right now, urgent right now, that don't have that kind of strategic long-term effect. Uh, there are things we need to address. Mm -hmm. Um, I partly think of this in terms of my time and effort. Those are things where appropriately delegating to staff and trusting that they will get done is the right thing for me to do. It's probably the right thing for a library leader to do to have those three priorities and make sure that all the bits and pieces of chicken feed work you have to do are understood in their relationship to those priorities and that appropriate high level resource and time allocation goes towards pursuing those uh, pursuing those priorities. Um, one of the things I said in my plenary was that at the operational level, nothing has startled me quite so much or struck me as a problem that needs fixing as the question of ebooks, how we buy ebooks and bring them into the library. Basically, I'd say the relationship between the library user and the ebook vendor that we get caught in the middle of is broken. Um, the things we're now producing as ebooks in libraries aren't ebooks, they're not very functional, it's got to change. Well, that's very important and very urgent and a lot of money is involved mm -hmm. right now. In the long run, I'm confident that will get fixed. Mm -hmm. I'm confident we'll get to a better place. Um, by the ordinary working of good professionals and uh, people responding to their users, thinking about what we need and pushing back to the publisher community. The long-term issue is how we build the most accessible and useful collection of library materials embodying current research and the cultural heritage of our societies that people can actually use, that don't disappear, that do get taken appropriate care of, that young generations coming along learn how to make use of. That's our core strategic job and in that context um, getting the ebooks right is one little stream down here even if it happens to be the one that's had oil poured on it and it's running on fire right now. The um, many libraries, most libraries, have to justify their value to the institution. It's one of the largest cost centers in a, in a uh, college or university. And uh, you've talked about the e-books, which is a, a very immature industry at the moment. It's really mm -hmm. only been around for a while. But um, when I look at things that are a little more mature, and I'm speaking specifically of the journal literature, the big deals, the bundled packages, I've found over the years both um, a lot of duplication in those bundles. You must get all the bundles because there is 5% that is unique and so much that is duplicated. I'm wondering, in your roles as provost and as dean, how can universities influence the industry to make the return on investment, frankly, better for the institution um, to justify the expense of the library? Well, there's, you have to recognize first there's only so much we can do. I think we do a pretty good job of doing that. Um, we are a sufficiently defined industry, particularly in the United States, uh, that it's possible for the 120 members of the Association of Research Libraries, uh, for the small number of thousands of institutions of higher learning to talk to each other, there are people to talk to each other, um, and to set standards among ourselves of what we're willing to pay for, what we're not willing to pay for. Um, we worry a lot about whether we've got enough money. You know, we are always going to worry about that. There will always be too much. If we suddenly got all of our budgets doubled, among other things, the number of startup publishing ventures that would follow immediately to help us think about the allocation of those resources would be striking. Um, we need to tell stories to ourselves and among ourselves about what it is we're doing, why we're doing it. We need to be smart about what we collect. We need to be smart about what we take a pass on. I think we do need to be more cooperative and collaborative with each other in collection development. I know it's an old grail that people have been chasing, uh, but there are technology reasons why we can do a better job of that now. Um, we belong to the Great Western Library Alliance, which is a consortium of 32 institutions, about 28 of which share their library catalogs and allow patron-initiated uh, interlibrary loan. Um, that's a really powerful service. It's quite new in that form. 
but it's already making a lot of us look and say, so just how many copies of this book do we need among these 28 libraries in order to serve responsibly all the users in that place? We've never been able to ask that question intelligently before, but this is the old story of if you can measure it, you can manage to it. Mm -hmm. If we can start to count some things like that, we can start to think about how we change our behavior. You said this morning uh, that, that really uh, it just jumped out at me, and I, I've read it use writing it on uh, lib licensed as well and this notion of all our students being online or all our you know we all all our students are online and what do you mean by that and what implications does it have um, walk around a small liberal arts college and it might not dawn on you as quickly as it does at Arizona State University where we have on our, our Tempe campus 60,000, we call them now, full immersion students walking around the campus. On a busy day, 45,000 of them are taking a course. And on that busy day, 10 to 15,000 of them are finding their way into our central building and another six or 7,000 finding their way into our, sci our large science library a couple of blocks away. So it looks like the library has a lot of face-to-face -face use. But if you walk the stacks of our buildings, the students are not there to make use of the material collections. Um, if they are, it's fleeting uh, grab-and-go use. Uh, we've invented grab-and-go as a form of dining. Um, we do grab-and-go librarianship now. They come in to get something, take it away, use it someplace else, and they may indeed be ordering it to be delivered to the front desk. Um, I know this for a very important personal reason, which is that my office now, it's a dream of an office for me. I've, I've got a key to the library after all these years. <laughs> My office is on the same floor as most of the books that I use for my scholarly work. And when I want one, I go online, I click a couple of times, and I pick it up at the front desk on my way out of the building because it's just easier to do that. So if we look at the behaviors of our students, we realize that even when they're in our buildings, they're not really in our buildings as traditional library users with pencils taking notes on, on rare books. Uh, and on the other hand, they're all of them using our collections and services online abundantly, mm -hmm. 24 by 7 by 365. Once upon a time, and I'll say that's 20 years ago, it was possible to say, we have our buildings, those are our libraries, and we supplement that with a little electronic mm -hmm. content. It's time, it's jargon language, but it's time to flip the model mm -hmm. and say the real library services, the real library collections are the ones that are being accessed online. What we do in the buildings is really important, but we need to think about how what we do in the buildings is no longer the center of our activity, but rather uh, an important portal to understanding our collections, learning how to use them, learning how to use tools, but the real action is going to be elsewhere. If you take that step and conclude that all of our students are online students, a very scary prospect opens up. It means that all of our services need to be available and deliverable to all of our online students. And that's a historic change. We're only partway through being able to deliver on that. I talked in my presentation about the importance of mass digitization and access to digitized books because if the books are only on the shelves, as wonderful as it is for them to be on the shelves, they're, they're, I, I'm not even going to say they're going to disappear. Most of them have already disappeared. They're gone from view. They're gone from use unless we provide intellectual access to them in appropriate, uh, in appropriate ways. And people are looking for full text. They want the actual text, the digitized text. I do. You do, right? Sure. Yep. Um, reading a few snippets, that work for you? Mm, I can work my way around it, but not hardly. This morning you said, uh, as one of your priorities, is the printed book has a glorious future. Uh, it seems to go counter with this just previous conversation that we will digitize, let us say, the work of the output of the 20th century, and and that assumes that the printed book might disappear, at least forms of the printed book, the monograph, let us say. So how do you bring those two together? Those two principles could be seem to be contradictory, but I'd have you bear in mind that one of our learnings of the last 20, 25 years since digital versions of particularly manuscripts and rare books have become available on the net is that consistently, wherever there's a project to digitize rare and unusual stuff, mm -hmm. one of the consequences is more people show up in person at the front door of the building to say, can I look at that for real? And they're looking at it for real uh, with a sharper, readier eye. They know what they're looking for, and they're ready to take advantage of it. Um, 
it's certainly the case that, you know, for example, all of the books that you can imagine buying in a bookstore today began as born digital. Um, they have been produced electronically on computer technology, and the fact of the printed book is an offshoot of that. I think we will see a change in the way the food chain is designed. Um, historically, that printed copy was at the top of the food chain. It was the only way in which this information could come out. I'm wondering which publisher soon will say, well, we don't produce the printed books any longer, but there's a way in which you can get one as a derivative object. Um, I'm following closely the development of print-on-demand technology. I'm surprised it hasn't come forward better than it has. I'm puzzled by that. I want to work on it because I think we will soon get to the point where the printed book, cheaply printed, serviceably printed, close to where you are, or virtually close to where you are, you know, in Amazon at this point doing same-day delivery, so maybe Amazon will be the print-on-demand mm -hmm. technologist, uh, but will show up when I want it, when I need it, and I will even think about throwing it away afterwards. When I was young, this was absolute anathema. Right. I can remember vividly at this moment, the day in 1970, when I took a copy of Dune Messiah in paperback, <laughs> deeply disappointed with it as a sequel to Dune, and took it down the hall and threw it down the trash chute and immediately felt like diving into the trash chute. Regret. Yes, I shouldn't have done that. Good <laughs> heaven. <laughs> now I find, you know, they're a little more commodity. When I want to teach from a book now, I'm more likely to get a new paperback copy, mark it up for use in that semester, and if I don't teach that course again, it goes away, and maybe I have a better copy that's my reading, annotating, scholarly copy someplace, um, someplace else. Um, the printed book has a long and glorious future in front of it, especially if, I guess I would say, uh, we're good at what we do. And my point in talking about that was to say that I think we've come in libraries to a point where we need to be conscious and deliberate and intentional about which printed books we have in our library buildings, how they're presented there, who they're for, how we make sure that people use them. If we have a million and a half books in our main tower, as we do now at ASU, and not hardly anybody is going to look at them, those books are not as valuable as could be if you had 500,000 presented differently, selected differently, mm -hmm. um, sold differently to your, uh, to your student population. Uh, you need to think about the way in which you bring people to confront these things, not simply to leave them with uh, call numbers on the spine mm -hmm. uh, for people to find if they know how to do that. We've got plenty of students now for whom that call number on the spine is not, as it was for our generation, <laughs> a miracle of access, but a deep puzzle, what do I do with this? Well, we should be thinking about what we can do that's better than that. So how do you balance the competing needs for a, quote, core collection, and, quote, a collection that serves the need of, of the people? We've had a number of scholars say, we, you must have this on the shelf. And your reason for needing the core collection on the shelf is what exactly? To represent the field. The to core represent works the field. in the field. Um, quite soon, if you read Against the Grain from Charleston, you'll see a column that I've written about my challenges finding uh, James Joyce's Ulysses mm -hmm. in print in the early 21st century. Uh, it's a lot harder than it used to be, but one of the steps in my quest was to go to the stacks of our own library and see what was uh, see what was there. On the shelves, at the moment I went into the stacks, there were two check-outable print copies of Ulysses. A bunch of others were checked out. Do those actually need to be on the shelves in the main building? Or could we be supplying those to whichever of our buildings? We have eight buildings to begin with. Could we be supplying them from our, librarians call it high-density shelving facility? Yes. My president calls it your fulfillment center. <laughs> could we be supplying it from our fulfillment center mm -hmm. when it's so popular a title, when it's so well known, when it is core? 
could we not instead begin thinking that the print collection in our buildings should begin to be a special collection, should begin to be different, should maybe rotate and turn over? Mm -hmm. um, should it be the place where the newest books are all shelved when they come in, including the ones in Croatian and, uh, and Hindi, um, in order to display to students just what the range and possibilities are of what we have when they've got a pretty good idea that Homer and, and Joyce they're available around here somewhere, right. and they have a variety of techniques for getting their hands on them, including bootleg copies over the internet. Right. Uh, I'm not sure I'm ready to say that any book that's ready, that's readily available in bootleg copies uh, or uh, public domain copies on the internet doesn't need to be on our shelves. But I'm at least looking down the pathway in that direction to say, if something is really ubiquitously available, why am I spending the most valuable real estate I have on making a copy printed in 1956 that's getting a little tired mm -hmm. available? Mm -hmm. Not sure. For other library deans that are confronting the same issue, this, and they want to go ahead and just provide the books that people really want in, in the building, um, what are you guys doing at ASU as you plan to do this? How, what are you going to do with the, uh, the space that you get out of this? What are, what are the kind of priorities that you're looking at in terms of services and, and the things that a lot of well, can do with that space? Sure. We're planning a big renovation, and I'd say there are really three categories into which what we will have when the renovation is over will fall. Um, one, and I want this highlighted on the main floor as you come in the door, is exhibit and presentation and special collections space. Um, I think what differentiates us as libraries will increasingly be what we have that's unique, and I want to present that and push it and sell it. Uh, and I want to market it hard. Uh, second, we will have what we now, it's fashionable to call student success space. Working space for our students. The value we provide in our building now to our students is a quiet, serious place to work as individuals, um, to engage in group study. I'm amazed that my generation, we were quite sure we were the smartest generation in the history of the human race. You remember that? <laughs> we, did, we weren't smart enough to invent group study. I walk around now and see students who've clearly made an appointment with each other in the evening yeah. for half a dozen of them to come to a particular place in the library and sit and work seriously for, for four hours. And I say, mm -hmm. yeah, we could have done that. Yeah. It's brilliant. Uh, we're also providing interactive classroom space um, on a scale that we've not done before. The other zone that we will have is what I'm calling the wizard zone. Uh, the space in which librarians, technologists, uh, data experts of various kinds will have centers for high-end research drawing upon uh, collections that broadly reach across the institution, uh, broadly reach across the institution's mission, both as a place in which to do good and important work with technology that might be hard to come by otherwise, but also as a place in which to train students in the use of these technologies. We're about to post a position for a direct of a geospatial research center, which is a very important thing for us to have. One of the reasons why that should be in the library, even though we have a school of geography on our campus, is because it's relevant to every discipline and every subject. Um, we expect some of the strongest demand for our geospatial center to come from the business schools, from people who are looking for tools and techniques to use and figuring out where to build the next Panera sandwich store. And we can help in that regard. Um, and we're also expecting expecting it to come from the life sciences and sustainability people um, who are interested in the history and present nature of the planet and how to understand that. And by the way, they're going to have to stop off at our special collections because we have in the ASU library a large collection of aerial photographs of Arizona taken 50 years ago and more. Uh, whatever your formal databases show about the history of land use and water use, aerial images can tell you stuff and help you focus your attention in ways you haven't done before. So the wizard zone will be the place where government documents and big data and geospatial and special collection stuff can come together and be used by high-end researchers and shown to and inculcated in the behavior of students, uh, of students as well. So you see, do you see this last being staffed by and people with joint appointments? Sure. A, li a librarian with a joint appointment in, in geology, for instance, or geography or oh. political science, working primarily in this area to forge these partnerships. You'll do that, and I would expect to be a regular employer of postdocs. 
yes. from various disciplines. Mm -hmm. Young people just finishing their degrees, Okura with the most important research technologies and the most important current work, and to be blunt about it, cheap to hire for a year or two mm -hmm. uh, to come in and work with our folks, get some credential themselves, but at the same time help our mission. Um, and then when they're two years past their PhD and all those skills they had are obsolete, hire some other young men. Uh, I'm a little bit in jest when I say that, but there's always still advantage in being able to bring in uh, the freshest talent sure. at any given point. Uh, I've also I've read a, a, a few things. You're, you're also concerned um, about the well, the university administrators are concerned. You, you've mentioned this uh, with things like freshman retention and time to degree. Uh, you know, absolutely. Well, yes. Kind of what role can the library play in helping? with this, this, these kinds of issues that upper level administrators are interested in? I think we can help most by prioritizing the way we spend our time and effort better than perhaps we've done in the past. Uh, concentrating with the uh, academic advisors outside the library on thinking about where are the hard parts for our students. Are there particular freshman or sophomore courses that catch more students and throw them off the tracks than others? Well, that's a good place to put your public services, your uh, subject librarians, to think about how can you work with faculty to design and support academic experiences at that level that are maximally successful for the people who like go through that. spots and, and, and addressing and, those. Sure. Um, you know, we will, it's a little like collections. Um, we are understaffed with professional librarians. Every librarian is understaffed with professional librarians. The right number of professional librarians is one per user globally. <laughs> We're never going to achieve that. Um, so we, we need to think about how we prioritize the work we do um, and where it can have the, the best effect. Um, one of the things I like about Arizona State is that our uh, fundamental institutional missions have been refined and sharpened and clarified by a brilliant president and his colleagues. And so it's easier to know where we should be pointing than I think it is in some other institutions. And so we look forward to this. One other factor in that is if all of our students are online students, then the delivery of services for students needs to be invented to be really effective uh, and really accessible um, online. We do a, a contact, a chat with a librarian button on our web page. Well, right now, for some hours of the day, we're outsourcing that by sharing the service with other libraries mm -hmm. uh, based on time of day and time zones and so forth. Difficult, but I'm not so sure that's a good idea, mm -hmm. that we shouldn't have ASU personnel 24 by 7 available who really know our curriculum, know our students, and are able to respond in, in the best ways. It's a direction in which to work. Um, so this was a question about freshmen and retention. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, and this is in relation to val the value of the library, are you doing work looking uh, five years, ten years past graduation on uh, graduates and to prove the value of the institution might be how successful are the graduates going out five years or ten years? Well, for for what you can do with the students who are here in front of you, you need to defer a lot, consult a lot, but defer a lot to the people who are designing success for students. Libraries shouldn't have its own model of what makes a successful student and try to uh, and try to live to that. Um, I would say, though, you're pointing in another direction that I'm interested in and spoke about a bit uh, in my presentation, um, and that is my conviction that there are no good reasons. Well, I'll, I'll generalize it this way. There's no good reason why anybody should ever be excluded from any library. Lots of reasons why. Mm -hmm. um, historically, we've wanted to be as inclusive as we can, mm -hmm. so we build marvelous public libraries, and then we ask to see your driver's license to know where you're supposed to, where you come from, whether we give you full privileges or not. You walk into a university library, we've, you've got to have that right ID card, you've got to authenticate. There's a lot of reasons why that's the case. Mm -hmm. But I'm convinced that in the long run, those reasons don't hold up. Um, I know people in what you'd call knowledge industries who are frustrated by the fact that they can access the sort of stuff we take for granted only with much greater difficulty and with much greater expense. I had this conversation around a table like this with three consultants not too long ago. And I said, so how does your firm get information? Oh, well, it's difficult. Oh, well, it's difficult. And the young'un, the junior associate sitting over here, 
had sort of a twinkle in her eye while they were talking about this. And I said, yes, so Kristen, so what's the twinkle in your eye about? And she said, oh, well, my sister's still at Ohio State, so she just lets me use her ID. Yeah, she yeah. has access to all the libraries. Okay, uh, I think that's the Lord's way of telling us that there is a demand there, there is a responsibility there to find ways to make this sort of information available and to continue to be part of the success of people's lives. If ever we had a model that college was like a gas station mm -hmm. where we filled you up and you ran on that fuel for another 40 years, that was, it was never true. And to the extent it had any truth about it, it died a while ago. Um, and now we need 24 by seven filling stations for everybody. Where's the funding to come, of course? There's the question with the industry as it is counting. I know. OK, we're talking strategy here, and you're giving me details? <laughs> I understand. <clears throat> no, but it's, I say that half in jest, okay. as often things I may say are half in jest. Right. Um, if we don't focus on what the goal is, yes. um, I will quote the, the recently departed and dear mentor for millions of people around the world, Mr. Lawrence Peter Barra, if you don't know where you're going, you're not likely to get there. Right. Right. Um, purpose of my presentation here and what I think I can contribute a lot in my job is keep looking out at that horizon and think about where it is we're really okay. trying to go and how what we're doing contributes to that. Your discussion about your little talk with the consultants and how difficult it is for them to get information also highlighted something else you said about this library size hole in the internet. And it strikes me as you talk about that, that that's something that libraries do need to work on, is to get their information out there so that it's more accessible and more, uh, more available to, to people who need it. So once upon a time, 15 years ago, I gave a talk to a big audience at the Society of College and University Planning. The question period afterwards, somebody got up and said, you're a classics professor, aren't you? I said, yeah. You've been talking about marketing a lot. Said, classics professors do that? And what I said was one of my best off-the-cuff off the, off the cuff answers. I said, well, you realize that uh, the classicists are the ones who invented marketing uh, back in the ancient Greek world. We just called it rhetoric. <laughs> um, I mean that dead seriously. Um, I think that we have an obligation as professionals, knowledge professionals who know all the good stuff we know, to do the best possible job we can of marketing the resources that we have. Um, in a world in which we are now competed with, as we were never competed with when I was a kid, the available supply of really bad information um, and really misleading sources is approaching infinity. Um, we therefore have an obligation to make sure that what we know to be the good stuff gets out there. I said to my staff when I first met them last year, that one way to think about this is to imagine what would happen um, if we monetized every transaction in the library. And I had to say, no, no we're not actually going to do that. But imagine if you were going to do that. Every search, every query, every consultation with the librarian, every checkout, every photocopy, if there was money in it for us, what would we do to maximize revenue, to push product? Think about that. I said, okay, whatever it is we should do in that way, we should be doing anyway because it's important to the users that we push product successfully in this environment. And we need to think that way. Uh, changing your reference services, changing your chat with a librarian, uh, changing your discovery tools by thinking about them as marketing devices, mm -hmm. thinking about them as ways to put what's really useful and really important in the hands of your users as quickly and easily as you possibly can, is going to get us more focused on some of the things that we really need, that we really need to do. Um, you, this leads me to my, my, my final question, I think, uh, and that's the, this notion of, you, you've expressed concern about scholarly integrity, peer review, and so on. Uh, and with the way scholarly communication is changing, the open access, and you just alluded to, there's a lot of junk out there. What can libraries do to, to help with this, to make sure that we do have scholarly integrity in the materials that are available to our students and faculty? I'm thinking of trying to trademark the phrase, the good stuff. <laughs> I think I might have some trouble doing that. <laughs> but it's part of my vocabulary to say, in libraries, we, we have the good stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, some of it is the good stuff for its intrinsic quality. Some of it is the good stuff because we've collected smartly and we have the, the cultural heritage of America, uh, some of which is pure garbage, but it's well chosen pure garbage <laughs> that needs to be preserved so that you can understand the Ku Klux Klan of a hundred years ago, sure, for example. Sure. Um, but that means we uh, we need to be the best partners that the people who make the good stuff can have. And here I would emphasize scholars and scientists. Mm -hmm. um, publication is getting less and less interesting. And publishing as, here I have this information and I make it available to you, mm -hmm. um, is in some ways easier. But the managing conscious choice of what the good stuff is and marketing that good stuff, that comes closer to what our core business has always been and what we should be concentrating on. If I look out 25, 50 years, I wouldn't bet that there will be publishers as we know them now. Yeah, there probably will be, but I'm not going to bet on that, partly because I never like to bet on things unless I'm absolutely sure they're going to come true. So even I would bet that the process we now call peer review, perhaps transformed, but that process will still be around and will be a high order priority for academics and for their academic librarians in order to make sure that we can tell what's the good stuff and what's not the good stuff. At the end of the day, if we're not delivering that information and marketing that information to our users, um, we might as well be some website or other somewhere that you take your chances on. Even with the good stuff, people always opt for the easy option. It is, it's a function yep. of who we are. Yep. We want to be more efficient. Um, how do you propose that institutions work with industry to make these discovery engines? We, we used to make our own homegrown things and we moved sure. away from that because it's difficult to maintain them. Um, you know, it's both the discovery engines but it's also the product. Well, um, yes. I said a little while ago that I'm worried about where ebooks are. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems with ebooks in our libraries right now is they are a complete annoying pain to use. Right. Okay, that means they won't get used. Uh, maybe the publishers are content with people going to use the bootleg PDF instead, uh, but I don't think so. Um, in fact, a court in New York just closed down several of the bootleg PDF sites. That war is continuing. So therefore, it's our obligation to push really hard on the publisher community to make the things they call eBooks. Mm -hmm as transparently, easily accessible to use, so that, I mean, my dream is I'm walking across the ASU campus someday, and I hear a student saying to another, yeah, I don't do Google searches anymore. I go to the library. That's where the good stuff is. Mm. Okay, maybe not before I retire, but I'm working on it. <laughs> what was the big, what has been the biggest surprise for you as the dean of libraries? Oh gosh, the biggest surprise. Apart from the extraordinarily large number of people who were willing to help me shelve my books in my office when I got there, <laughs> I hadn't had that experience, uh, that experience before. Um, I think maybe it's my, uh, my awareness of the gap that is opening between where the next generation is and what we're able to provide. Um, their life as digital natives, this is trite enough to say, uh, versus the way in which we provide the services. And if I come back then to say we've got to do the marketing, um, it's because I think we've got to find a way to bring together the riches that we have to offer and will have to offer with the best way to make them support uh, the lives, the careers, the imaginations of our students and our faculty and, and ultimately as librarians, uh, the whole society in which we live.